In this lecture, we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence, how to control and manage your emotions. A lot of you are familiar with the term IQ. What if I tell you that nowadays there's also something called EQ, your emotional IQ in a nutshell. This concept of emotional intelligence that back in the day wasn't that important is becoming one of the most crucial factors when it comes to our daily lives. In one of the best books written by Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, and you might be familiar with it, I was reading the book and then there's something about emotions that really, really grabbed my attention. The author says emotions are disturbance. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, if it's affected by emotions, it will be completely different. I gave an example in previous lectures where my marketing professor said, if you ever feel depressed or sad, of course, depression is not an emotion. When we talk about emotions, we talk about fear, um, anger, sadness, joy, disgust, uh, surprise as well. So in this case, we're talking about sadness, for example, or anger. And what the professor said, don't work on anything related to marketing if you're feeling angry or sad. And the reason why is because when you're having these emotions, they block your creativity. When you're stressing out about something and you keep thinking about it over and over and over again, even if you're uh, writing a test, even if you're trying to study, even if you're trying to write a book, you have days where there are things that whatever you do, you can't stop thinking about them. And the reason why is because they are triggering emotions inside of you, which is causing disturbance. It is disturbing whatever you're doing. It is disturbing your tasks, of course. It's disturbing your stream of thoughts. And it's disturbing your body chemistry. If you have feelings of joy, you're going to feel a dopamine rush inside your body. You're going to feel euphoria. When you feel surprised, you might have feelings of being overwhelmed. You might, uh, if something surprised you in a scary way, you might be, your heart might be beating fast. Uh, of course, uh, when you have the emotions of fear, you might get sweaty, you might start trembling. Um, all of that to make you understand that emotions are not just uh, random feelings that you get. Emotions are powerful. They can change everything. If you wake up every day feeling emotions of joy, no matter what's happening in the world, you wake up and you're feeling joy, your life would be so much better. But if you wake up every single day and you have emotions of sadness, your life is not going to be as good. You're not going to have the same motivation, the same drive, the same work ethic that you would have if you are feeling happy, if you are feeling emotions of joy on a consistent basis. And the thing about emotions is that to an extent, you can't always control them. But what you can do is that you can be intelligent about it. You can know how to use your emotions to your advantage and control them to an extent. Nobody will have emotions of joy when they break up with somebody they love. Of course, unless the relationship was toxic and they wanted to uh, break up. But if the person was in love and they wanted to stay with the other person and then they break up, you can't avoid feeling a bit sad. Even if you have a lot of emotional uh, control, it gets to a point where you're going to feel some emotions, but you need to know how to be smart about it, how to overcome it, how to not let it affect you. Now, adding to that as well, organizational behavior theories and research that basically deals with all the factors that can contribute into having a better organizational structure, keeping the employees happy and keeping them uh, effective and efficient so they can finish the work really well, um, finish the work uh, faster and at the same time be happy and be comfortable where they are. And when I was going through different organizational behavior studies, I ran across something really important. In organizations, and of course, in life, there's a difference between emotions and mood that people usually mix up. 
Emotions are short-lived feelings that come from a known cause. While moods are feelings that are longer lasting than emotions, of course. And there's no real starting point for its formation. Emotions, as we said, uh, can include sadness, joy, feeling happy, feeling sad. While moods are kind of different, you either have a positive mood or you have kind of a negative mood. And sometimes you can experience both of them at the same time. Even when you have a bad mood and you feel like you don't want to do anything, you're being very negative about everything around you, and then your kid or your partner or your friend looks at you with a genuine smile, and you feel happy, you feel joy for a second, you feel this warmth in your heart. Even though you're in a bad mood, you still feel the emotions of happiness, even if it's for a brief moment, but you did. And of course, in contrast, When you're in a good mood and something bad happens, you find out that the exam that you wanted to get an A plus on, you got an A minus. So you're kind of a little bit disappointed. And even though you're in a good mood, you might feel a little bit sad, but your good mood will help you boost it up. And usually you can explain your emotions. You can explain why you're sad. You can explain why you're happy because you know what's going on. When you feel emotions, there is always a source where these emotions came from. There's always something that happened that triggered these emotions. But moods, when somebody is in a bad mood and you ask them, why are you in a bad mood? Most of the times, most of the times, the answer is, I don't know. Most people don't even know why they are experiencing this bad mood. They have absolutely no explanation and they can't seem to control it most of the times. And because moods cannot really be linked to any specific cause, at one point, a lot of people mix between being a moody person, which means a person whose mood fluctuates a lot, and somebody who suffers from bipolar disorder. People can't explain moods where it got to a point where they put them on the same equivalency as a mental health disorder. A lot of times, I know a lot of people who referred to people who have a lot of mood fluctuations as people who are bipolar, when in fact, it is not true. Mood fluctu fluctuates a lot. Of course, some people experience it more than others, and this, of course, is linked to different factors that includes the environment uh, where you're living, even lights. A lot of people during winter, they get these uh, bad mood phases because there's no sun and they feel like uh, everything around them is dead, especially when it's cold and there's nobody out in the streets. They feel bad moods and they can even experience a lot of emotions like uh, they might feel sad, they might feel lonely at one point. And To top it off, there's also a difference between emotions, moods, and feelings. There is a difference between being angry and feeling angry. There's a difference between saying, I feel cold, and I feel cold. One of them is physical, and the other one is emotional. Feelings are usually things that we feel. We feel on a physical level, not just on an emotional, psychological level. And another thing about feelings is that it can be influenced by your own personal experience, beliefs, cultural beliefs, and memories and recalls. And the worst part is, most of the times, it's subconscious. Your personal experience, your beliefs, and your memories are not things that you're Uh, consistently conscious of. There are things that are in your subconscious mind that you can't really control or see unless you do a lot of introspection. And what happens when you have some emotions that are triggered, then your subconscious mind spurs out all of these personal experiences, beliefs, and memories that are related to this feeling. Sorry, emotions, I mean. Your brain will spur out all the memories, personal experiences that are related to the emotions you're feeling. And based upon that, you will start feeling. Your brain will interpret these emotions and turn them into a physical phase. And of course, this is where neuroplasticity steps in. 
we have our mood that if it, that is influenced by a lot of factors and of course the influence of all of these factors on your mood depends on past experiences on how each and every one of these experiences is wired in your brain if every single thing every single experience that you went through in your life triggered feelings of joy and excitement nothing can put you in a bad mood of course we're not talking about body chemistry when we talk about body chemistry you might get to a point where we're talking about mental health problems and that's a completely different issue when it comes to people who are suffering from mental health issues and we are not talking about some very uh, rare examples or in cases mental health let's go according to statistics uh we're going to go through the statistics of Canada only the canadian mental health association states all these different things on their website mental illness indirectly affects all canadians at some time through a family member friend or colleague i'm going to include this article in the course for those of you who are interested in knowing more about it moreover in any given year one in five people in canada will personally experience a mental health problem or illness and approximately 8% of adults will experience major depression at some point in their lives to top it up about 1% of canadians will also experience bipolar disorder or manic depression the total number of 12 to 19 year olds in canada at risk for developing depression is at a staggering 3.2 million and unfortunately only one out of five children who need mental health services would actually receive them and the problem is not the health system in canada there's a lot of mental health awareness and all the health services are free you can get a psychiatrist a psychotherapist or a psychologist for free and i know that this is not the case for a lot of countries there are a lot of countries who um, culturally disregard the concepts of mental health illnesses who consider mental health illnesses just as any mood or emotion and feeling and can't really uh, differentiate between all these different factors that can have different experiences on the human uh, brain and the human body so for those of you who are experiencing um some symptoms of mental health disorders if you have feelings and you and you feel like you just can't control them you feel depressed and you feel uh, switching in mood that is abnormal you need to see someone it's for your own good otherwise you will live with this problem for the rest of your life not being able to change it sometimes very rarely a change might happen without any uh, use of medication or without talking to a doctor it just happens through experiences and of course wiring there are a lot of experiences that can affect you that would get you out of where you were but the safest and best way to deal with it is to see somebody who is a specialist mental health disorder can disturb your emotions your mood and of course your feelings now going back to our topic of emotional intelligence question is after 13 minutes of talking what is emotional intelligence in big what is the big picture behind emotional intelligence well it's basically the capacity to be aware of to control and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships in an emotionally intelligent way so emotional intelligence is not just about your own personal emotions it's about the emotions that are coming from external stimuli which means the emotions that other people are emitting when you walk by someone who is angry you can feel the emotions of anger you can see it in his eyes sometimes but when you pass by somebody who's smiling has his head up listening to some joyful music well you know that this person is probably experiencing uh, emotions of joy and the thing is we're not going to go through feelings and we're not going to go through moods because both of them are mainly affected by emotions and experiences by dealing with your emotions you will deal with the experiences and then automatically your feelings and your mood will work accordingly so by now you know that neuroplasticity is affected by emotions big time and we talked about this before first time experiences what kind of emotions you felt 
during this first time experience. This has a huge impact on what this first time experience will do to your brain. This plastic brain that is vulnerable, especially when it comes to first time experiences, if there's a huge load of emotions involved, there's going to be a strong wiring right there. And now the big question is, what kind of emotions did you feel? And we gave the example of going to the zoo before. When you went to the zoo and you got bit by a snake, you got emotions of anger, um, fear, maybe sadness. And what that did is it developed two fears. First, a fear of snakes. Every time you see a snake, you will have emotions of fear. And of course, emotions of doubt around zoos. You're not sure if it's a safe place for you anymore. And most probably, whenever you go back to a zoo, you'll feel uncomfortable. That's if the emotions were so strong, you might not even want to go to the zoo anymore. You might feel such a high level of discomfort that you just don't want to go at all. And the second idea is, it's not just about first time experiences. And I know we already talked about this before, but for those of you who were not paying a lot of attention back then, this is crucial. And really, if you didn't listen to it before, go back and listen to it again and again until you really grasp the concept. Emotions are one of the most important concepts when it comes to neuroplasticity. So emotionally charged situations. I'm going to give a really far-fetched example that is, of course, it's reality. In case you have somebody who's really close to you who dies. This experience will have a lot of emotions involved. This is exactly what an emotionally charged situation will be like. There was a huge fight between Mike Tyson and Douglas. Douglas's mother died a few days before the fight, and she told everybody that he's going to win, that he's going to win against Mike Tyson. When his mom died, and there is, of course, a, a lot of uh, articles and YouTube videos that talk about this experience because it's absolutely inspirational. After his mother died, he was so emotionally charged in a positive way. He didn't dwell and get sad. He felt a lot of motivation. He felt like he needed to make his mom proud. And in fact, he beat Mike Tyson. And afterwards, when reporters asked him, how did he do it? He said, before my mother died, she told everybody that I'm going to win. And when I was in that ring, I had one of two choices. I either die with my mom or I live on to make her proud. Even though it was just a few days uh, before his mother died, um, in these three days, a situation that is highly emotionally charged can start wiring your brain. And now one of the obstacles that might stand between emotions and neuroplasticity is emotional instability and failing to keep up a consistency. And of course, we talked about this. Not being consistent will fail to ensure the linking between the different neurons and ensuring uh, proper uh, neural networks forming because of it. But emotional instability, uh, which is exactly the opposite of emotional intelligence, is also one of the biggest problems. And it's usually it causes problems with consistency. When you have a lot of different emotions and you're unstable emotionally, you will experience a lot of different uh, behaviors from yourself that can stand in the way of consistency. Now, emotional stability can be caused by current situations, by stress and anxiety and thoughts that you're having in your mind, so problems that you have to deal with. And of course, it can be caused by mental health issues. And we already talked about this. You need to find um, a professional that can help in case you feel that the problem is bigger than just controlling your emotions and it's something deeper. It's something on a mental health awareness level. But if it's something random, something that's causing you stress and anxiety, something that you're experiencing because there's a certain problem that you want to solve, don't focus on working and uh, breaking your head over finishing work when you're feeling emotional instability. Deal with the problem first, finish the problem, and then move on to work. And in case you can't really find a solution for the problem, maybe you're waiting for something and you're anxious, you don't know what the result is. I would highly recommend a book called How to Stop Worrying 
and start living. The biggest enemy of emotional intelligence is worrying, and which of course brings us to emotional instability. And this 352 pages book cannot be summed up in a few simple words. If you also feel like worrying is one of your biggest problems, um, getting this book would be a good idea or looking at some articles to help you cope with this problem can be also a really good idea. Um, I'm going to include an article that also talks about worrying and how you can overcome it. But I read the book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie, and that's why I'm recommending it. Um, One of the best practices in the book that I always use is to ask yourself the following question. How bad can it get? Or what's the worst case scenario? Now, once you know what the worst case scenario is, you can't overthink it anymore because it can't get any worse than that. This is how bad it can get. And you need to know and understand that it can get to this point. And of course, you need to accept and understand, especially if it's something that you can't do anything about it. If you already wrote an exam and you're waiting for your grades, you can't do anything at this point. So look at the worst case scenario and accept it. This, of course, works when there's something that you're not very, very worried about. But as I said, the article will give you way more information and will help you way more if you want to cope with worrying. Now, once you really understand the concepts, the techniques and the exercises of emotional intelligence, you can use emotions to your advantage and ensure emotional neuroplasticity enhancement. If you want to try to make working out a lifestyle, And every single time you go to the gym, you have emotions of sadness and uh, irritability. You're most likely going to drop it and not go there because your emotions are not helping you. They're wiring bad ideas, bad experiences, bad emotions uh, to the idea of going to the gym. But if every single time you go to the gym, you have these positive thoughts in your mind, how you want to look, what's your goal, where you want to get. And you keep this image in your head. When you, have a certain, uh, when you have a certain body and you have a certain aspiration, a certain future body that you want to attain, keeping that in your head, thinking about it, thinking about how you would feel about it, having these emotions of joy and, and a lot of motivation linked to it, then you'll be linking neurons in a different way. Your neural structure and network will actually start to encourage you to go to the gym more. That's exactly why before the gym becoming a lifestyle that you don't even have to think about, you're going to experience days where you just say, you know what, I don't feel like going to the gym anymore. But because you have a lot of emotions of joy involved with it, one of two scenarios would happen. One scenario would be, that because the wiring is already starting, you will not stop going to the gym. You will just say, you know what? I don't have to skip. I can't skip. I have goals and I need to attain them. I need to achieve them. That's why I'm not going to skip and I'm going to go to the gym. And this is mostly willpower. Neuroplasticity is more automatic. When you're thinking about it and you have different ideas in your head, should I go or not? Uh, you did not reach a point where neuroplasticity has been perfected and working out became a lifestyle. Now, the other scenario, and this is also not linked to neuroplasticity, we're talking about the phase before neuroplasticity, you trying to reach the point where you're using your plastic, flexible brain to make out of exercising a lifestyle or consistent automatic behavior or habit. So in the second example, you feel emotions of sadness, you feel down. And when people feel down, you're not being lazy. That was the first case scenario. You were feeling lazy, you didn't want to go to the gym, but you used your willpower to go there. Now, in this scenario, you're feeling emotions. You're feeling emotions of sadness, emotions of uh, fear, anger, whatever it is. And you just say, I don't want to go to the gym. These emotions will give you feelings and the feelings might put you in a certain mood And then you don't have the motivation and the willpower to go to the gym. And when that happens, this is exactly where emotional intelligence would step in. You have two solutions. One, you say, okay, I am sad. 
I don't want to go to the gym. I want to sit at home, watch Netflix, and eat ice cream. And the second scenario would be closing your eyes and thinking about why you started going to the gym. Thinking about your why. Nietzsche says, he who has a why can bear almost any how. Um, there was an entire book and an entire field of science based on the question, why? Um, there's a book written by Dr. Viktor Frankl. The book is called Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of the most fascinating books you can ever read. Uh, it sold millions of copies and it talks about prisoners' experiences in concentration camps and how the people who survived are the people who had a why. In concentration camps, usually you can't have positive emotions. You're always feeling anger and sadness. You're always having these bad emotions that would affect you in a negative way. What's the only thing that can give you good positive emotions at a concentration camp? Your why. What is your why? And just like worrying, figuring out your why is not that simple, especially when we're talking about the big image, the big question of why, why do we exist? And of course, this gets us into existentialism and it's an entirely different field of study as well. It is one of the most common problems nowadays. People are thinking about their existence and they're asking themselves a lot of questions. Uh, back in the days, religion was way more reinforced and the why was always explained through religion. But now that a lot of people are switching towards atheism and other stream of thoughts that don't follow religion, they started asking themselves the question, why? Why do I exist? What am I doing in this world? And when they don't find, a, when they don't find an answer, of course, they will feel empty. They will feel like there's nothing to do in this world and they're just going to live and die. And then a lot of people would suffer from depression. Some of them would even get to suicide when in fact... It's not that complicated from my experience and from what I've read. And I can assure you, I read a lot about uh, a lot of books, and a lot of articles, and I watched a lot of videos that talk about the question of why, uh, why in life. Putting the concepts of religion aside, having a why in life, not just to know where you're going, but to know what you need to do every single day. But on a smaller scale, you can always figure out what your why is. Why do you have problems in relationships? Well, maybe because you're not ready to be in a committed relationship. Maybe you had past bad experiences that are still affecting you. You can figure out what your why is. Why are you going to the gym? Maybe you want to have a better body. Maybe you want to prove somebody wrong. Maybe you want to just improve your health and take care of your health more. Whatever your why is, when you go to the gym, You have a why. There's a reason why you're going to the gym. People do not just wake up and say, oh, I should go to the gym for no reason. So when you feel these emotions of sadness, close your eyes and think about your why. Letting go of the scenario where you would just sit at home and avoid going to the gym. And this is where people, most people, when they do this, they say, I don't feel like going today because I feel sad their brain gets adapted to it. The, the thing about neuroplasticity is that it's happening every single second. So when you drop the gym, when you say, I'm not going to go because I'm feeling sad, this is wiring your brain in a way that affects your willpower in a negative way. This will not give you a better mental state for you to be able to go to the gym tomorrow and be uh, way better. In some cases, in some, in some very rare cases, it is when there's uh, highly emotional charged situations that you encounter that day and you just couldn't focus and just couldn't go to the gym. It's fine. But I'm talking about people who just do it as an excuse. When you close your eyes and you think about your why, you will start having feelings of, and emotions of course, of joy, of hope. And what you do is you just go to the gym. There's a lot of exercises that we're going to talk about um, in the section where we talk about habits to be able to push yourself and go to the gym. Um, one of them, and of course, we're going to go more through details later, uh, the bracelet technique where you have an elastic band on your wrists. And every single time you feel like you're trying to establish a habit of going to the gym and making it a lifestyle. And every single time you have a feeling that you don't want to go to the gym, 
for any reason, you just close your eyes, you think about your why, and then you snap the bracelet on your wrist in a way that it hurts a bit. Of course, you don't want to cut yourself, but in a way that hurts a little bit, and then you just go to the gym. You stop everything, whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking, you just stop everything and you go to the gym. And I can, I can assure you, if you do this, if you have a goal of going to the gym and you have a why behind it and you had feelings of sadness, you didn't want to go to the gym and you were thinking about skipping, close your eyes, forget about the bracelet for now, just close your eyes, think about your why, think about it and feel it. Try to generate emotions from it and then go to the gym. And if when you finish the gym, if you don't feel at least 1% better, than how you were before, keep it in mind that you did not skip and you're ensuring the plasticity to be working effectively. If you did not feel any positive emotions or you did not feel any better out of it, then you need to look at your why again. Sometimes your why is not strong enough. If the answer to your why is, I want to go to the gym, it's probably not a strong why. But when you have a reason, a why, and the answer is, I need to go to the gym. You don't just want, but you need to go to the gym. Then your why is on a whole new level. And when you have a why that you answer it with, I need to go to the gym, and you go to the gym, I can assure you, you are going to feel better. So what's happening right there is you experienced bad emotions, then you closed your eyes, and you thought about positive thoughts that brings you good, positive emotions. A big part of it is being optimistic, of course. Looking at things from positive perspective can sometimes be hard. Most people tend to be negative when it comes to a lot of different things in their lives. Um, there is a blog that has a lot of useful information on how to become more optimistic, and I'm also going to include it in, um, in the course. So in case you feel like you're not really optimistic. You can always go look at it. Um, but the big picture is, regardless of what you are, if you're optimistic or you're pessimistic, whenever you feel bad emotions, one of the best things to do as emotional intelligence is to close your eyes and block everything. Block your phone, block your computer, block everything. Sit down in your room, close your eyes, uh, maybe add some music. If you know, if you have any music that would encourage you, that would give you some positive emotions, any music that is linked to positive experiences that you love listening to, you might want to put this, put this, put this music, put the song, and close your eyes and think about why. Think about your why. Think about positive emotions. Think about where you want to be and where this particular thing that you're trying to avoid would take you. See, the thing about the brain is. The brain cannot tell the difference between reality and imagination. When you close your eyes and you imagine yourself at the gym lifting weights, your brain can't really tell the difference between are you actually there or are you just imagining lifting weight. Of course, your body knows because you're not lifting any weight, but your brain doesn't really tell the difference between reality and imagination. So just imagining yourself at the gym is a start. Imagining yourself going to the gym and reaching the body that you want to reach, reaching the goal that you want to reach. I'm giving a gym as, as a general example. You can apply this on every single aspect of your life. But these emotions would reinforce the links. These emotions would ensure neuroplasticity. Even though you're not at the gym, but your mind is still getting the connection of going to the gym and there's a reinforcement. There's a link happening between neurons and they're getting, the link is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. Now, of course, uh, I'm not saying you should just sit in bed and imagine yourself working out every single day and then out of nowhere is going to become a lifestyle. This is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is bad emotions can be met with positive reinforcing emotions and then these would give you a little push some motivation, some willpower that you need to use to go to the gym. And when you go and you actually do the experience, not just mentally, but also physically, because as we said, imagination is one thing, but your cortical map is linked to different motor skills from the fine motor skills to the gross motor skills. When you go to the gym and you bench press, this is a gross motor skill. When you go to the gym and you do some exercises for the forearms, usually this is a fine motor skill. Your perception 
hearing the weights drop, hearing yourself pushing the weights and then dropping them on the floor, um, smelling maybe, maybe the dumbbells smell a certain way, your visual perception of everything that's going on, your touch on the bar, all of these things would reinforce the neuroplasticity. And to top it off, the emotions. And that's why imagination can be really different than reality for your neuroplasticity. Even though it can help a bit, but it's nothing compared to what you will get in terms of actually going to the gym. So having emotional intelligence, having a high EQ, having a high emotional IQ will ensure better social skills, better focus and concentration, better mental wellness, and better life overall. When you know how to use your emotions, when you know how to control them, every single aspect of your life will change and you know it. The example that we gave before, where if a person wakes up every single day feeling joy, his life will be completely different than a person who wakes up every day feeling sad or from a person who feels sad twice a week. It's just common sense, right? So using emotional intelligence to work on your social skills. If you have social anxiety or you feel like you don't want to go out because you're being lazy, then you close your eyes and you think about your why. Why do you want to improve your social skills? You want to have maybe a bigger connection, a bigger network so you can reach more people. You have a business and you want to reach more people. Maybe you just want to make more friends. Maybe you want to become the cool kid. What is your why? And when you feel lazy and you want to have better social skills, you close your eyes, you think about your why, you reinforce it with positive emotions and you just go and do it. And then when you're there, you're using your emotions, you're using your sensory and motor skills, and you're ensuring proper integration in your mind. Eventually, the goal is to ensure neuroplasticity and you're walking on the right track. Same thing goes for focus and concentration. When you're having bad emotions, you will not be able to focus and concentrate a lot. But then when you have reinforcing emotions, when you close your eyes and think about why you need to concentrate and focus on a certain task you're working on, then it's a different story. You might regroup your focus and concentration. And this, you can apply this to, as I said, every single aspect of your life, whether it's social skills, focus and concentration, going to school, going to class, writing a book, uh, public speaking, anything. To be able to eventually ensure better mental and physical wellness. And once that happens, you are working on an effective and efficient neuroplasticity method. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about a few techniques that you can also use to ensure emotional intelligence. And the first thing is, plan A is not guaranteed. Having plan B or and C can prevent negative emotions in case of disappointment and failure. I usually listen to motivational speeches that always say, don't put a plan B and don't put a plan C, put a plan A and put all your work into it to ensure that it works. And I admire these speakers and I admire every single word they say. But if we pause for a second and we think about it, isn't there a 0.1 chance that for any reason, plan A might not work? This has nothing to do with being optimistic or being a pessimist. This has everything to do with being realistic. Now, the biggest achievements in the world were, were made when people weren't realistic, when they thought about what's impossible and they made it possible. So I'm not saying you should be realistic in that way where you shouldn't have high expectations and aim high. What I'm saying is being realistic, we might know and we for sure we know that plan A is not guaranteed. Even though there's a very small risk, it might not work. But having a plan A where you're aiming for something impossible and you think that you can reach it, you think that you have what it takes to get there, do it. You need to do it. It's people like you who are going to change the world. People who believe that the impossible is possible. These are the people who will change the world. But if you don't have a plan B or a plan C in case of failure, you will experience a lot of negative emotions. And not just from you, but for everybody around you. Nowadays, we live in a world where social media controls everything, where people celebrate their success on social media 
people go out of their houses looking like absolute shit. Sorry for the word, but it's true. And then when they want to post something on Instagram or Facebook, they make sure that they look top notch, that they're wearing their best clothing, they look happy and joyful, even though they're feeling miserable. So having to deal with your own emotions of disappointment and sadness uh, after failing, you also have to deal with your social image, how people will look at you, how you've been talking about your dreams and you're saying that you're going to make it. And then everybody's going to look at you and say, here's the guy who worked for five years and didn't make anything. Here's the guy who worked for five years. When we were in college studying, he was working on his business and now he failed. He doesn't have a degree and he doesn't have a business. When we have a degree and now we're going to find a job and we're going to start making money and life is good. This will make you feel bad. We compare ourselves to our peers and our friends without even noticing it because we live in a social media, Instagram, Facebook world where it's all about comparison. You see a new post, somebody posts something, it's your friend and you liked it, you would like the post. And somebody else would post something where they make you feel like they're, they're kind of better than you and you won't like the post. It will make you feel bad. But if you have a plan B, then it's an entirely different situation. Plan A is almost there, but having a plan B and working on risk diversion is always good, especially when we're talking about emotional intelligence. Sticking with a plan A and not figuring out any plan B or plan C is you taking an emotional risk. You diving into a puddle, not knowing how this might affect your emotions in case of failure. And I'll give you a very quick example, a very personal example, actually. I started working on my business, on my social media and marketing agency about a year ago, and I was still in school. And I met a mentor that gave me an advice that changed my life. She was the one who explained to me how having a plan A and plan B is always a good choice for your emotional intelligence. I was talking to her. My business was growing and it needed a lot more work. And she knew it. And I said, I'm thinking about dropping out of college. I'm thinking about just dropping out of my program and focusing on my business. And then she asked me a question. She said, how positive are you that your business is going to work and make you a lot of money? I said, I'm very positive. And then she said, what if something happens that you cannot control and your business stopped working? Maybe you can't find any reason why your business might not work. But keep in mind, people who died never planned on dying. People who drove their cars at 120 miles an hour were not planning on having an accident and dying. They always thought that they have everything under control and that nothing bad can happen. Nothing can make them die. But it's the things that you don't expect. It's the 0.1% risk that you don't look at that can actually destroy you. And then she said, carry on with your business and keep working on it, but don't drop out of college. Because if in three years your business fails for any reason, for any reason, she's not saying that it might fail, but there is a 0.01 risk that it might. And if it does, you have your degree and you can find a job to save some money so you can get back up and work again on your plan A. But if your business fails, you don't have a degree to get a decent job and get good money to be able to save. You maybe lost some money and now you don't have a degree. You need to find a job that's probably paying minimum wage so you can barely afford your living expenses and you will find it very hard to stand back up and work on your plan A, especially because when this happens, you will have emotions of anger, disappointment and sadness. And usually these are emotionally charged experiences. But when you have a plan B, the disappointment, the sadness and the anger will not be as hard because you always know that you're working on your plan B to get to your plan A. I would never advise anybody to drop their plan A because usually plan A is what you want the most and you shouldn't stop working on it until you die. Every single person has, has a moral obligation to work on their dreams and their goals. These are the people who 
live life to its fullest. These are the people who, once they're on their deathbed, will not look back and say, I wish I had done this or I wish I had done that. So even though you're feeling down, even though you're feeling sad and you're feeling disappointed because you failed, you have a plan B that's supporting you. You go to plan B and you keep in mind your plan A. You're not going to stop. You know that you're not going to stop until you get and achieve plan A. So when you have a plan B, you will get back up. You'll work again and you'll be more likely to jump back into plan A and make it work. When I have a degree and my business fails, I can get a job that pays well and I can invest money again in my company to make it grow, to fix the problems that I couldn't fix before. And then I can achieve plan A. And once that happens, once plan A is done, I have my, I have my business and it's working well. I always have my plan, my plan B in my pocket, which is my degree, which is the situation where for any case in the future, my business failed again. I always have my degree to go back at it. And here's the beauty of it. Most people in college, they want to drop out of school um, because they want to focus on their business. But let's put it this way. Focusing on your business and going to college. And of course, this is just an example of plan A and plan B. Your plan A and B can be applicable on any aspect of your life, of course, just like uh, emotions and experiences. So after following her advice, I was always in school and I was still working on my social media and digital marketing agency. And in fact, she was right. I got to a point where my business wasn't working the way I wanted to work. Things were not working according to plan. And I had to put some money into the business, but I couldn't because I was going to school. I was not working and I was working on my business and I had no source of income. But my plan B, the fact that I was pursuing my degree, plus all the experience that I got from building my business, got me an internship right away with one of the biggest marketing firms in, in Ottawa. And it all happened because I had a plan B. And once I got back into plan B, I was able to go back into plan A and grow it bit by bit. And now it's working well. It's not where I want it to be, but if I didn't have a plan B, maybe I wouldn't have the agency anymore. I couldn't have, I couldn't get any money into the company and I couldn't grow it anymore. And then it would fail. So whatever goal you have, whatever you're trying to work on, whatever plan you have, sit down and figure out a plan B or a plan C if you can. Now, second thing is accepting the inevitable. Sometimes we can't control the situation. No matter how many plans we have, we can't fully control the situation. And then we need to adapt, we need to overcome and accept the inevitable. Because when something happens and you have no control over it, you have one of two options. You either dwell or you accept. And when you dwell, you're going to be stuck. You're not going to move forward when the rest of the world is moving forward. But if you accept and you move forward and you move on, you adapt and you overcome it, you will be wiring your brain in an emotionally intelligent way. You are learning to accept failure, overcome it, learn from it, move on and grow from it. But if you dwell on it, you're going to learn that failure is bad. Failure will make me feel sad. I want to avoid failure at any cost. And you just want to avoid failure because it doesn't make you feel good. And that's just our human nature. We want to avoid the things that makes us uh, feel bad. And that's where most people would drop their dreams, where most people would not have such high aspirations anymore. Uh, they accept so little because they don't want to encounter failure anymore. And unfortunately, it becomes wired in their brain. The concept of not failing and the concept of security, it becomes hardwired in their brain. If your dad ever worked on a business and it failed and he dwelled on it for years and eventually started working full time and you grow up and you say to your father that you want to start a business, he's not going to say, yes, go for it. It's going to be awesome. He's going to say, no, starting a business can be risky. You might fail. You might uh, get disappointed. It's better to work on a degree and get a safe job. 
And did you ever pause for a second and ask yourself, why would he say this? He would say this because of the neuroplasticity process. His experience and the emotions that came with this experience, all the different motor and sensory skills that were involved and everything wired his brain in a way that he wants to avoid risk, aka he wants to avoid business because, well, business is risky. So even though you have a plan A or a plan B or a plan C, even though it's a very small percentage when you have a lot of different plans, but it might get to a point where all the plans didn't work and you don't have any more plans and you need to accept your reality and look at your options. Look at what you can do to uh, get yourself out of where you are and just start going back at it to go again to your plan A or to your plan B or to your plan C or just change the plan entirely if you think that it's not working right. Moving on to the next exercise, count to 10. A lot of you heard people say count to 10 before you say anything or just take a deep breath. Nowadays, it became just a slang that people would just say randomly uh, when they want to tell somebody to just chill down. They're like, dude, take a deep breath or count to 10, you know? But there is a lot of wisdom behind this technique. When you react based upon impulses, you are reacting based on your current emotions. And when you react towards your current emotions, you are reinforcing them. When you're mad at someone and they try to talk to you and then they start arguing with you, you know that the most probable result is that you guys are going to have a fight. If you start arguing back, and you start screaming at him and shouting and having hand gestures, you're just going to get yourself more angry. The other person in front of you is going to feel also emotions of anger, maybe fear, or you might feel threatened. And you will also get affected by external stimulation. And before you know it, you find yourself having a huge argument, a fight, feeling even more angry at the person. And you guys had a fight and now you're not talking to each other anymore. But if when the argument starts and you know that you're getting angrier, you're getting more upset and you know that most probably an argument is going to happen and eventually a fight. You guys are going to stop talking to each other or whatever. But instead of arguing back, if you count to 10, you just stare not at the person, just stare elsewhere, count to 10. Take a deep breath and be aware of the emotions you're feeling. It's a very simple yet effective technique that you can use on a daily basis to ensure emotional intelligence. I promise you, this is one of the techniques that help me personally the most. This also implies to different examples. The example that we gave uh, about the gym. If, let's say, we put the scenario in a way where you're having a conversation with the gym. The gym is saying, hey, come here, work out. And you're saying, no, I feel sad. I don't want to go. But then you stare somewhere and you count to 10 and you take a deep breath and you really become aware of your emotions. You're going to see that you're feeling sad. Most people never get aware of their emotions. They get sad, but they're not aware of their emotions. But when you get aware of your emotions and you know that you're feeling sad, you have the chance to change this. So when you're arguing with someone and you get upset, you're mad, you're angry, and you count to 10, you take a deep breath and you realize that you're angry. And you know that if you're angry, you're having these emotions of anger. If you're gonna talk to the person more, it's gonna result in a fight. And once you know the consequences, you need to ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it just because you're having some emotions? And as we said, emotions are usually short term. You have a fight with your best friend. Two hours later, you guys text back and everything's working and everything's back to normal. So when you ask yourself, is it worth it? Are these emotions worth getting me to uh, have a fight with my friend or getting the consequences that might happen? And most probably, most of the times, the answer is no. And once you figure out that the answer is no, think about something else. Think about something positive. Think about all the good things that the person did and not all the bad things that the person did. Think about why going to the gym would help, why going to the gym would make you get closer to your goals and not why going to the gym 
might take a lot of effort and a lot of energy and I just don't feel like it. It's easy and it's quick. You're not feeling okay, you're not feeling comfortable. Usually when you have bad emotions, you don't feel uh, comfortable at all. You feel uncomfortable. And then you pause for 10 seconds. You ask yourself very quickly, what am I feeling? And usually when you ask yourself this question, you're going to find the answer right away. Once you find the answer, you ask yourself, what's going to happen if I keep having these emotions? What's going to happen if I keep being angry at the person? And also, the answer is going to be like a, a light bulb that lights up. You guys are going to have a fight. And is it worth it? The answer is no. And now you know that you need to switch up your emotions to avoid the consequences. And instead of screaming at the person, you would look at them, you would smile, and you would say, can I tell you something? I was really upset about one, two, three things that you did, but I love you a lot and you're my best friend and I don't want to have a fight and I don't want to argue, but I just want to talk about these things because I got upset and I don't want to have these feelings again. And I'm pretty sure that as a friend, you would understand this. Boom. Completely different scenario that can change everything. Maybe the first scenario could have led to, to a moment where you lost your friendship. And just because you counted to 10, you took 10 seconds, you changed the entire stream of uh, actions and pulling your bad emotions. And guess what that does? You guessed right. It works better towards your neuroplasticity. You are reinforcing positive emotions and therefore positive habits. The goal behind neuroplasticity is to wire everything that is positive in your mind. Positive emotions, positive thoughts, positive actions. And through everything we're going through in this course, this is where you're heading. Now, the next exercise is to learn to say no. A lot of people don't know how to say no. You can trace this back to failed parenting strategies. You can trace that back to past experiences. You can track that back to guilt trips that you went through for saying no. When your friend asked you to help him with, uh, with his essay and you didn't have the time to do it and you said no and then he failed the class and he says, if you only helped me, like I could have at least passed. This guilt trip that you went through, eventually, as we said before, our human nature wants to avoid all these bad feelings and bad emotions. So when you get wired, your brain gets wired at one point that whenever you say to somebody, when somebody asks you for something and you say no, a guilt trip will follow. Even if he doesn't say anything, just when you say no, you are going to feel guilty for saying no. There's even a book that I ran across uh, at the library at, at the university. And the title is, when I say no, I feel guilty. And of course, as we said, the way it happens is that it becomes wired in your brain. But you need to learn how to say no. And most importantly, learn how not to feel shame when you say no. And how do you do that? You control your emotions. You can use the count to 10 strategy, take a deep breath strategy, do some introspection and understand that you're feeling shame and simply switch back to positive emotions. Think about all the good things that you were able to do because you did not spend six, seven hours working with your friends on an essay. And of course, you shouldn't always say no. If your friend needs your help and you have the time, you have nothing to do, you might as well just help them. But the problem is when you have some things to do and you don't know how to say no because you feel ashamed and then you say yes, at work, when your boss asks you to do something and you just can't say no because otherwise you'll feel shame and you'll feel that you're not working hard enough and you're too hard on yourself and then you got a lot of workload and before you know it, you find yourself staying at the office till nine at night. Why? Well, simply because you didn't know how to say no. I will also include an article about this, how to say no without feeling guilty. So you guys can take a look at it if this is one of your problems. Um, but one of the strategies that I use is kind of different. The way I look at it is trying to help other people because eventually they will help you back. When you take six hours to work with somebody on his essay, 
If you ever needed something from them, they'll be there for you. Most of the people, of course. Some people are just uh, full of BS and they just won't help you, even if you help them over and over again. But what happens when you want to help someone, but you're running short on time? He needs you to help him for six, seven hours when you only have one hour to spare. This is where emotional intelligence would step in. Instead of going through the roller coaster of saying yes or no and feeling guilty or feeling shame or feeling uh, pressure because you said yes, you can simply say this. Let's imagine two scenarios. Your friend says, hey, can you help me with my essay? I have, I have it due tomorrow and I had to write three, four pages. I'm not sure how long it would take, maybe five, six hours. But I mean, I just really don't know what to do. And you might say, um, look, man, honestly, I have a lot of things to do and I can't really help right now. If you're working on your emotions, you might say this and not feel bad about yourself. You'll feel okay. You'll just think that, well, this is my right. I have other things that I need to do and I did the right thing. People who feel shame about saying no need to work on their emotions and look at the article that I included. But the scenario that I would follow is the following. He would ask me the question and I would say, of course I can help you. There's no doubt about it. Just let me know what's what's the essay about. And then he would say what the essay is about. And then you showed genuine interest that you really, really want to help. And then you say, okay, no problem. I got your back. Let me check my schedule. I'm not sure what I have to do later on today or tomorrow, but I'll let you know. Just give me a couple minutes. And then just think about what you have to do today and tomorrow. Think about if you have the time to help him or not. And if not, if you have some time to help him, maybe you have one hour or two hours. But the fact that first, you didn't show emotions of negativity. We said before how powerful the word no is. When you say no to somebody, most probably they're going to feel a little bit sad because if they weren't, if they didn't have a 0.1% possibility in their head that you will say yes, they would have never asked you to begin with. After checking your schedule, you might say, uh, look, um, I only have one hour because I have this, 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 and that to do. So how about, how about I help you with the curriculum so you can know what you're going to write about and then you do your research and you go from there. Now, he's not just going to appreciate that you're helping and he's not just going to owe you and he's going to help you in the future, of course, if he's a good person, but he will feel that you went over this to check your schedule and squeeze in your schedule and you sacrificed an hour to be with him. And of course, to help him with his essay. In this case, you feel good. You're not pressured. You had an hour to spare and you spend it with him. Next time you might need something from him. He will be there, hopefully. He doesn't, he didn't feel bad. He didn't feel any uh, negative emotions. In the contrary, he felt really good. He felt like you're a loyal person. He felt like you're somebody he can trust. He felt like you're a true friend and everybody is a winner. And even if you don't have the time to spare, you have a lot of stuff to do. After you say, yeah, for sure, man, just let me know what's going on. What's the topic about? Okay, for sure. Let me, let me check my schedule. And you check your schedule and you say, look, I have this, 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 and that, that I need to finish today. And you precise what the things are. You say, I have to uh, write my assignment. I need to get the groceries and I need to help my dad with something. Instead of saying, I have a lot of stuff to do. Being precise is always better. It gives you more authenticity and you seem more genuine and more trustworthy. It basically just shows that you're not just saying no because you just don't feel like it. And even when you don't feel like it, you can, always, you can also use this strategy because it's really helpful. And you carry on to say, I don't think I can help today, but I will try to finish things as fast as possible. And if I do on the right time, I'll let you know, and then we can work on the essay. Of course, he's not going to feel as good as when you said, I have an hour and let me help you with the curriculum or with the, with the outline of the, of the essay, but he's not going to feel as bad as just saying, no, sorry, man, I can't. I have a lot of stuff to do today. And just try it. 
Next time somebody asks you to do something, try the first scenario to say no bluntly and that you have a lot of stuff to do and see how you feel and see how they feel. If you feel negative emotions, just uh, switch back, close your eyes, think about positive emotions, what you're going to do in this time and move away from these sad and, and bad emotions. And try also the other scenario, get excited, ask him questions, let him talk, let him, let him see that you're interested. And then if you really have the time to spare, do it. If you have six hours, do it. If you have one hour, do it. Or if you don't have time, just say, look, I have this, this, and that to do. I'm going to try to finish them as soon as possible, and then I'll help you. Then the person knows that even though you're not helping right now, but you have him on your mind, and you're going to try to finish things fast so you can help him. And even if you don't, he will consider it as not a person who said no, not a person who just refused to help, but as a person who tried his best, but he just had a lot of stuff and he just couldn't help. You can add to it saying at the end, if you didn't find any time, you can call him or see him and say, look, I still have this to get it over with. Um, if I don't find the time, uh, I'm sorry, but next time you need anything, just let me know and uh, I'll see what we can do about it. This is exactly what emotional intelligence would look like. You are taking care of your proper emotions. You're taking care of the other person's emotions in a way that, of course, the other person's emotions, if they're bad emotions, they will affect your own emotions. And we already talked about this. So you're being emotionally intelligent with your own emotions and with the other person's emotions as well. Now, going further more into emotional intelligence, some concepts that we already talked about and some concepts that are kind of new that we need to discuss real fast and that you need to keep in mind because they're also a part of uh, raising your emotional IQ. And first things first, stop blaming others. When something happens and you blame others, you will feel helpless. You will feel that the other person had the control over the situation and you had no control over it. The reason why this happened is because of what other people did and not what you did. And you can never change what other people did, but you can always change what you are going to do. So if you got a bad grade and you just say, the professor just doesn't like me or the professor is just too hard on the students, even when you're studying for the next exam, you're going to have these uh, emotions where you're just going to think that even though you're going to study hard and no matter how hard you study, the professor is not going to give you good grades. And this, of course, will affect the quality of your studying. But if you used your emotional intelligence and said, no, I don't want to blame the professor. I want to blame myself. Maybe I didn't study hard enough. Now, in this case, when you want to study, you're going to have emotions and a mentality that's saying, you need to work harder, you need to study harder for you to get a better grade because it's all up to you. And this will affect the quality of your studying in an absolutely positive way and you know it. You can control situations way better than other people. So stop blaming others, take responsibility yourself. Even when there is some blame to put on other people, try to work it out yourself because as we said, you have more control over yourself than over other people. And with control comes stability. And with stability comes stable emotions. Now working in an emotionally intelligent way will help you get these positive and good emotions and wire your brain in the way that you wanted it to be wired. Second thing is avoid making excuses. And this is interrelated with stop blaming others. When you blame others, you are usually giving excuses. But it's not just about blaming others. Making excuses can be you saying, I can't go to the gym because I can't afford supplements. This excuse right there, you are committing emotional suicide. Because first, you're not going to the gym and this will hurt the process of wiring and making out of exercising a habit or a lifestyle. And then you're getting more bad emotions in by saying, I don't have money. And all of this just because you wanted to make an excuse. 
But if you did not think about excuses, you want to go to the gym and you want to make it a habit, you don't look at excuses, you just look at executing, you just look at going to the gym and you make a habit out of it, even though results are not going to be the same, for example, without supplements. But in three months, when you save up some money and you buy supplements, you're not going to start from scratch. You're going to start from three months into the gym. You have good power, your body's getting better, you can lift more, and the supplements will help you even more. Third is learn how to communicate. And one of the most important techniques to learn how to communicate is, of course, to count to 10 when you're having bad emotions that might cause bad consequences that we already talked about before. And another way to deal with it, if you find that you have a lot of problems communicating with people, you might want to get Dale Carnegie's other book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's one of the best books I've ever read when it comes to influencing others, communicating and building trustworthy, authentic connections on a daily basis. It would also help you avoid these arguments and all these situations that would actually hurt the relationships and affect the way you communicate in a negative way. And because this is also a very important topic and we communicate every single day, if we don't know how to communicate properly, it can cause us a lot of problems on an emotional intelligence level and furthermore on a plastic brain level. So there's going to be also an article uh, regarding this problem. Now, the next technique is to embrace change. Most people are afraid of change. Sometimes people are excited to change, but most of the times when a sudden change happens in your life, you will not feel comfortable at all. And these bad emotions that comes with this unexpected change, you need to be aware of them and to be emotionally intelligent, you need to switch them into positive emotions as we talked about before. Once you become aware of them, and this will bring us to the last technique that we have, which is focus and focus on introspection. Focusing on introspection is basically you becoming aware of your emotions. You, uh, every single time you're feeling uncomfortable or, or you have some feelings that are making you feel bad, look into your mind and ask yourself, what's going on? What kind of emotions am I feeling? And then deal with it switch up these bad emotions into positive emotions that would actually help you. Look at change as an opportunity to increase your neuroplasticity. You have more experiences. That's one way to look at it. If you just look at change as an opportunity for you to enhance your neuroplasticity, to enhance your brain and build more connections and more neural networks, this by itself will make you embrace change instead of dwelling on it. And lastly, being optimistic. As we said, there's going to be an article about it to know more information about it, but it's one of the most important aspects when it comes to emotional intelligence and just kicking away the bad emotions. Being optimistic is just looking at the positive and the positive would always give you good emotions. And this would bring us to the end of this lecture. Mastering these techniques. You need to make out of emotional intelligence a lifestyle that supports you, not drag you down. You need to use these techniques in neuroplasticity, reinforce desired actions with emotional charge and protection, and avoid network disruption by using prevention and adaptation methods. All the techniques, methods that we discussed in this lecture, if you use them and you understand them and you look into them in an emotionally intelligent way, It will not just help you on a day-to-day basis. It will not just help you with your mental and physical health. But if you are putting in the right actions that you want to wire in your brain, it can change your life when it comes to neuroplasticity. You will find yourself wiring all these actions way easier than you would if you were having bad emotions. The goal is to understand how important emotions are. And of course, that reflects in all the different examples that we gave. And to understand how to use it to your own advantage, which basically means how to be emotionally intelligent and how to focus on the good emotions to reinforce the desired actions. And a huge part of it is to also use bad emotions to prevent undesired actions. So when you want to stop something, 
And every single time you do it, you enjoy it and you love it and you think about every single thing that you love about it and not the things that are actually hurting you, you're not being emotionally intelligent. When you want to stop smoking and every time you smoke, you have emotions of joy and that, that seems that you can't really control when in fact you can, you are not being emotionally intelligent. But if when you smoke, you feel shame of yourself, wanting to stop and you just can't, you feel shame about what you're doing to your body. When you're smoking and you imagine the smoke getting in your lungs and ruining them, when you imagine yourself getting a chronic disease that will hurt your health a lot, and you do all of these things while you're smoking, instead of having these emotions of joy, you'll have emotions of anger, sadness, disappointment, And the more you do it, if every single time you smoke, you think about these things, as we said, the human nature wants to avoid bad feelings. Bit by bit, you will start to wire this in, and every single time you want to smoke, you will have these bad emotions and bad feelings. And because the human nature wants to avoid it, this will help you if you're trying to quit smoking. Now, physical dependence on the nicotine is a different story. And it can be hard, especially when you're suffering from withdrawal symptoms. You'll feel a lot of discomfort. And you're going to learn way more about this in the habits section. How when you have a physical dependency on something, how your body on purpose would make you feel discomfort and would make you feel like the only way to feel comfortable is to go back to the thing that you're uh, withdrawing from, the thing that's, that you have physical dependency on. And that's where most people would give in and they would just go back to smoking or whatever habit they're trying to stop. But for now, this is more than enough for you to understand and be emotionally intelligent, work on these techniques and be consistent and you will start seeing results in no time.